Well, I want to say a few words of welcome. I'd like to welcome all the district governors, county governors, all brethren, the ladies, and the, the uh, juniors as well. I'd like to welcome the band here, our readers, and uh, ladies and gentlemen who are just to visit, and our singer Abigail as well. All very welcome. Thank you. Hand over to the Reverend Boyd. Afternoon, everyone. Just at the outset of our service of worship uh, this evening, I just want to express my thanks to Brother Wallace uh, for the words of welcome and for the invitation uh, to conduct this historic service in the life of Desert Martin Purple Heroes, LOL 376. Can I also bring you fraternal greetings from County Tyrone Grand Lodge, from Pomeroy District, LOL number 5, and from my own private lodge, Marie Temperance, LOL 195. As we come to worship God this afternoon, let us still our hearts and bow before him in prayer. Let us pray. King of Kings, we come to unite our hearts and to unite in fellowship one with the Lord, to bring our worship in the form of prayer, of hymns, of singing, of reading and the preaching of your holy word. And so, Father God, we come, as the psalmist says, to ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. We are to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And so we pray, Father God, as we have understood the instruction of your word, that we would be a people that would come to obey that and to do it. And so we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'd help us to focus our thoughts on this warm Sunday, Sunday afternoon on you. Help us to learn, Lord, from the time spent in worship. We ask that you would forgive us for those times that we have strayed from your path and from your will. Not only, Lord, do we pray for ourselves, but we pray, Lord, for our nation. That you would forgive us as a nation when we have turned our backs on your holy word. When our laws have been passed contrary to what you have laid down. And so, Father, we pray that you would forgive us and help us to return once again to be a nation that upholds the principles of Scripture and desires to worship and to honour Almighty God. Father, as we come, we thank you that we can confess our sins before you because through the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his shed blood on the cross at Calvary, we can be assured and we can know that we have our sins forgiven. And we pray, Father, that that may encourage us this afternoon, that as we come to you, we can be made righteous, we can be made right with God through that shed blood at Calvary. So, Lord God, as we gather in the comfort of this hall, as we gather in freedom and with liberty, we pray that as we come to worship you, that we may really know your presence amongst us, that we may hear you speak to us through our time of worship. And Father, we may be a people who would rejoice in the presence of God, that we may be a people who would say that it has been good for us to have gathered here this day. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We open up our order of service uh, and there we see the words of our opening hymn. The words, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross.
point in our service, we're going to hear God's word being read to us by junior brother Luke Pitts as we turn to Psalm, Psalm 46. A reading today is from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, seal it. There is a river of the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raised, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to seize on to the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear and the sunder. He burneth the chariot and the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Thank you, Luke, for bringing us that word, uh, that psalm, Martin Luther's psalm uh, of encouragement to us this afternoon. And we encourage you uh, and the juniors uh, as you grow uh, and as you learn about uh, our faith and about your history. We're now going to uh, invite our soloist for this afternoon, Abigail Wenlock, to come uh, and to sing for us. Cheer my heart to sing thy 
Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. Our New Testament reading is Revelation 19, beginning verse 11. I saw a heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He threads the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast 
and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This is the word of the Lord. We come to the part of our service worship this afternoon that no doubt many have been looking forward to, uh, and that is uh, the opportunity uh, to unveil uh, the new plaque. Uh, and the Lodge have invited Brother James Austin and Brother Harry Stewart uh, to come uh, and to have the pleasure of performing that this afternoon. So we hand over uh, to, to the unveiling. Father God, as we bow in an attitude of prayer this afternoon, we thank you for our new king. We thank you, Father, for our nation. Father God, as we come, we thank you for the foresight, for the vision, and for the wisdom of this lodge as they seek to commemorate the coronation of King Charles and to bear testimony to this historic event for generations to come. So, Father, as we gather here this afternoon, we now dedicate this plaque in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may it ever be a reminder to us and those who enter and visit this hall to fear God and honour the King as we live our lives and await the return of the King of Kings. Amen. Just to say that the, the plaque this afternoon looks tremendously well and thank you Brian for unveiling it to us uh, and we trust that each one will be able to get a closer look at it not just this afternoon uh, but certainly in the days and years uh, that come and again we see there included for us those words of wisdom from the book of Proverbs uh, which gives us great advice and wisdom in the living of life this afternoon no doubt we come uh, with still fresh memories of how we celebrated the coronation of King Charles III uh, this uh, Sunday, our last Sunday afternoon, uh, I was sitting in the presence of Desert Martin Accordion Band as well, so uh, I'm on a roll with them, uh, and they were playing kindly for us uh, at our church picnic at the Mance uh, in the afternoon, just as they are playing uh, for you here uh, today. <coughs> do you remember? Do you remember in the coronation service where uh, the young boy stepped forward uh, and stood in front of King Charles? Uh, and as he stepped forward and stood in front uh, of King Charles, 
He said, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. Then King Charles replied, in his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. I found that striking. I, I have read uh, and looked at the coronation ceremony from the late Queen Elizabeth. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until I watched that, uh, actually on a large screen, being played that... I could see the significance, I, I could see the spiritual attachment and relevance in teaching that was set out in that service right from the start. The King of Kings was referred to. That's something we want to think about this afternoon, just as we want to think uh, about our King. Charles became King on the 8th of September 2022 at the age of 73 and uh, as the younger people will know and most likely the historians and older folks amongst you that Charles is the oldest monarch to be crowned in British history. Prior to Charles, if you want to check the record books, the oldest monarch to be crowned was King William. Now not King William III but King William IV and he was crowned at the age of 64. Charles, uh, as we have followed uh, the course and the events of his life, has been waiting. He's been a very patient man. He's been waiting to be king since he was three years old. Another interesting fact about our new king is that he studied at Cambridge University. And he became the first British monarch to hold a university degree. He's very gifted with language. He can speak fluently in English, Welsh, and German. He can also say a few words in other languages. <laughs> <laughs> he is a qualified diver and pilot. He's a, a painter, an artistic painter. He also is musical. I discovered that he can play the cello and daily played in the university orchestra while he's a student. There's some of us who can be forgetful. I forgot to bring my white gloves, which I apologize to the merciful master. But uh, sometimes we forget important documents. But as King, Charles is the only person who doesn't have to worry about carrying his driver's license, or carrying a passport. He can go anywhere in the United Kingdom without them. And as we reflect on British history, as we reflect on the history of Israel in the Bible, we know that there have been good kings, there have been bad kings, and there have been those who have been in between. They, like us, are all human beings. No one is perfect. And yet scripture tells us that we are to fear God and to honour the king. That word king or in the plural kings is mentioned in our Bible over 2,000 times. For example, in the book of Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21 we're reminded that God changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. I'm sure that, like me, many of you thought that the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, would never die. You would just waken up and she'd be there in the throne and life would go on. And what a shock to get the news that she had passed away. But that was in God's timing. That was in God's sovereign plan. And the psalmist, Psalm 138 and verse 4 says, All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And Proverbs 8 and 15 tells us that by God kings reign and rulers decree what is just. 
So th this afternoon, uh, as we acknowledge the role of, of the king of our country, uh, as we acknowledge the references to kings <coughs> in, in the Bible, we want to reflect on God, the one who allows himself to claim the name King of Kings. He allows individuals to rule on earth, but he claims for himself the title, as we've heard from a reading in Revelation, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Modern day thought, well, it will immediately spring to dismiss the truth that God is the only true God. Modern thinking will want us to be able to appoint our own rulers rather than God's rulers. Modern day thinking will want us to serve ourselves rather than serving others and serving God. The Bible tells us that God is the King of Kings. So that, just as we learn, some things about King Charles, what are some of the things that we can learn about the King of Kings? Charles III, by virtue of the fact that he becomes sovereign of the nation, <coughs> becomes head of the Anglican or the established church in England. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the glorious head of the church, in the sense where the church means the redeemed, those who have come to saving faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. We read in Revelation about how the author of this book, John, he in this dream saw heaven open and he beheld these things that we read. There is, there is a sense in which everything in the whole of the book of Revelation is an introduction to the revelation, an introduction to the unveiling of Jesus Christ as King of Kings. We here in chapter 19 reach the point where he returns to earth in power and in glory. It's back in the Old Testament where in Isaiah 62, the people cry out, Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down. In our reading, Jesus Christ is described as being on a white horse. Now, in, in this hall this afternoon, we have another king riding on a white horse. And there's much discussion, and the juniors will be able to pick this up. Maybe they've already been thinking about having been thinking about what colour King William's horse was. No, you haven't been thinking about it. We're going to think about it today. We're going to think about it today because historians tell us that King William's horse was not white. But as you look, as you look at the picture in this hall, King William is riding on a white horse. And why, why do you think possible? And the same is true, uh, if I'm right, on your banner. You have King William riding on a white horse. And we have read here about the King of Kings coming on a white horse. In biblical Israel, a white horse was a sign of victory. So most likely as people painted King William on a white horse, they were reflecting the victorious a King William at the Battle of the Body. White Horse, uh, from the time of Israel, the Israeli army uh, in the Bible was mainly made up of soldiers on foot. Uh, and if you had an army that contained a horse or a number of horses, that was deemed to put you at an advantage over the enemy. And no doubt that's the mindset here in this prophecy uh, that as the king of kings returns riding on a white horse, this was a sign of victory, uh, it was a sign of triumph and of power over the enemy. We read also that the picture is painted, that the clothes, the vesture is dipped in his own blood. His name is the word of God, a name none fully knows but himself. 
The Word of God was manifest in the flesh. Angels and saints follow the King of Kings as he returns to earth for his church. The threatenings of the written word are given that he's going to execute and apply on his enemies. The King of Kings is a name of authority, of complete sovereignty. The power and the dominion of the rulers on earth will be taken away by the King of Kings. We as Protestants, we pledge ourselves to the King of the nation being Protestant, to the Queen being Protestant. And yet there will come a day when our King, our Queen, whoever is on the throne at Christ's return, will be removed. The authority will pass to Almighty God. And so it's important for us in our lives to keep the balance between the place of things spiritual and the place of things national and political. Because ultimately it is God who is in control. And we're to su submit to him and to his word. Because one day it will be clearly seen that the rulers of this earth will submit and fall before him. God has given us our rule to walk by and to live our lives by. He has given us his word. And so there's a call on us as individuals. There's a call on our nation to live by God's word. Because Christ will come in judgment. Revelation pictures it as the king of kings coming on a white horse to make war against his enemies. To come as judge and as general. The world that rejects him will be judged by him. One of the Bible commentators says, the world likes a complacent, reasonable religion. And so it is always ready to revere some pale Galilean image of Jesus. Some meager anemic Messiah and to give him a moderate, rational homage. Folks, as we look at the state of our nation, as we look at the biblical decline of our nation, are we not guilty of wanting this pale Galilean image of Jesus? Are we not also keen to have an anemic Messiah? But how sad that is for us when we again look round our hall and oftentimes encounter that flag of Northern Ireland which says, in God, our trust. Is that where our trust truly is today? Is your trust and is my trust in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Saviour? Is he the king of your life and the king of my life? Or do we live to serve something else? or someone else. So today as we think about the coronation of King Charles III, as we seek to commemorate that, it is good to think and to reflect upon the fact that one day the King of Kings will return. <coughs> the King of the King Charles <coughs> may never come to Desert Martin. He may never come to Pomeroy either, for that matter, or to Tuppermore. But one day, the King of Kings will come. And all of us, wherever we are, will see that event. We will see the King of Kings face to face. And so, are we prepared? Are we ready for that day? 
what a tragedy for us, particularly those who belong to the Orange Institution. Those who profess to uphold the Reformed Protestant faith. Not to know, not to trust, and not to love the Saviour Jesus Christ. The one who has given us religious freedom and the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's table on which sits the open Bible with the truths of eternity and of salvation. So may we be people who embrace the words of truth. May we be people who embrace the Saviour Jesus Christ who will come one day as the King of Kings. In the history of our nation, there have been many famous moments. There have been many times of great blessing. There have been many wonderful events. Many of those we can pick up as we remember the reign of Queen Elizabeth, as we look forward to the reign of King Charles, as we read the history books of times gone by. I once visited the Outer Hebrides and the, the port, the harbour of Stornoway. And there we read of a tragic story in the life of our nation. It was the 31st of December 1918. The First World War was over. The soldiers had made their way back from France. They had survived the war. They made their way back across the English Channel into England. They'd made their way up across the English border to the northern coast of Scotland. They then waited for the ships. Initially there was to be one, but there were so many and they were in a hurry to get home for New Year's Eve, to celebrate with their family the end of war and peace and the beginning of a new year. So an extra ship was put on and the soldiers set sail for their home on the Isle of Lewis. They headed from the mainland Scotland to Stornoway. As they sailed up, the families were waiting for them. They'd got their clothes out of the cupboards. They'd hang them in front of the open fire. They were getting them warmed for their loved ones coming home. A storm broke out. The ship was wrecked as it struck rocks 100 yards from land. And something in the region of 300 soldiers died 100 yards from home after surviving the war and making their way back. They were so close yet so, so far. What a tragedy. And so what a tragedy it would be for us to be so close to the truth and not to know the Saviour, the King of Kings. So may this plaque, as it reminds you of the coronation of King Charles III, may it remind you that one day the King of Kings the one who offers to be your saviour will return and we are to be ready. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for this opportunity of worship, of fellowship and fraternity. Father, as we gather, we're mindful and thankful of the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation. We thank you for the gift of your holy word, a word that is available to us in our own language. A word that is available for us to read and to study. And by your grace to embrace and believe. We pray Lord that we may be a people who know the Lord, the King of Kings. That we may be those who wait with joy and with hope for his return. Amen. Let's turn again to our order of service as we turn to the words of our closing hymn.
I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how you could love me, a sinner condemned unto me.
Good day, officers, district officers, uh, missing brother, and your own brother. And I just want to thank you all for coming on behalf of the Lords here today. It's a uh, very, very encouraging to see the see the crowd here today. Uh, the the Reverend Boyd, uh, thank you for your for taking service today. As Martin and Martin Don for the taking us around the route today. Uh, to Abigail, uh, thank you very much. Uh, to uh, to Doug Butts, um, to Ron the Deputy for doing the readings for us today. And to your to to Ron for unveiling the flag for us today. We very much appreciate it. And uh, I guess all I have to say is so, uh, safe home, brother. And uh, thank you very much.